Grace, mercy, and peace be to you this morning from God our Father and from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, there is a word I came across as I was reflecting on this gospel Easter text. It's not a word I had ever heard before. It'd be a pretty hard word to throw into some casual conversation. The word is frisson. F-R-I-S-S-O-N. Frisson. Noun. And though it sounds like I'm describing a loaf of French bread, it's actually a word that comes from a Latin one, and it's where we derive the meaning of frigid, and frisson is a word that's meant to describe that strange but almost enjoyable sensation of fright. When you're both at the same time scared and excited, it's that frigid chill that's followed up by a fierce kind of thrill. Maybe you know some frisson addicts, those people who love to be scared and excited, the ones who choose to watch the scary movie, the ones who force you to go into the haunted house. It's the skydivers and the roller coaster enthusiasts because they like what it does for them. They feed off that stuff. Maybe you don't quite seek it out like that, but I'm sure you've experienced it before. Maybe it's the long but intense hiking trip and you're so excited but a bit nervous because it's a trip you haven't taken before. You're not quite sure where it's going to lead. It's the new relationship. And you're so thrilled to actually get to spend time with this person and she even feels the same way. But you're terrified because you don't want to mess it up. It's the first day of class. Do you remember where everyone was just so excited to be there? You might have even dressed up a little bit because there was so much to see and take in. A new environment, new classmates, a new instructor. They gave you the syllabus on that first day, everything down on paper that you could expect for the semester. But I bet you were maybe a little more interested in the energy of that moment. The anxious excitement that filled the air. It's something that, at first glance, seems like a strange combination. But maybe they go together more than we tend to think. And it is exactly the combination that we find in our text this morning. As Jesus rises from the grave on that third day following his crucifixion and death, the adrenaline is already high, even from the start. Mary Magdalene and another Mary go to see Jesus in the tomb, but what they got was an earthquake, an angel that came and effortlessly rolled back that stone. And the guards who were there to watch the tomb, they only got to the friss part of Frisson. No joy or excitement for them. As they see this angel, they're filled with fear and dread, and they hit the ground like dead men. But to these women... The angel brings a word of peace. He tells them that Jesus is risen just as he said, and now he's heading into Galilee, and they need to go and tell the other disciples and get there now too if they want to see him. And then in verse 8, we hear how these women left the angel. They departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples they left the tomb, running on fear and joy. And that might seem strange to us. Why the fear? Why not all joy? The Son of God has just beaten death. He's accomplished all that he said he would. He provides hope for everyone who has longed for the possibility of life after death, more than just what we see and know in this earthly life. It was this Jesus who cast out seven demons from Mary Magdalene. Jesus freed both these women from the oppression of evil forces, treating them with such tender compassion. So why leave in fear and joy? I wonder, in part, if it was just the overwhelming truth of what this moment meant. They knew the possibility of Jesus being who he said he was, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. But now, now they're faced with and living in the reality of that truth. And this is a great path and journey to be on. They get to go and spread the good news that Jesus lives. But it's a path that these women or anyone else had never been on before. 
And they might not be totally sure exactly where it's going to lead. Jesus has laid all this out in his preaching and teaching. But this is a lot to take in, in a moment. Death now ends in life forever through Christ. It's the greatest news in the world, and it will shatter your world in the best possible way. Perhaps fear and joy isn't such a bad response to this Easter message that we've just heard. After all, Jesus' resurrection, it's not just a pit stop. It's not a sidebar that's on the same level as every other good thing that Jesus did, all his healings and miracles that Jesus has done in his ministry. Resurrection changes everything. Without resurrection, the Bible tells us our faith is futile and we're still in our sins. Without resurrection, if our hope is only in this life, Christians should be pitied more than all people. Maybe that's a healthy kind of fear we can carry. It's in knowing how much was at stake. All our eternal destinations that rested in Christ's hands and by Jesus' death and rising again, everything has now been accomplished for us. Not because he had to, but because he chose to. Because he loves you. And he brings you the news of this victory. And it's a word like the angels that brings peace into our lives. An overwhelming sense of joy and gratitude. Christ's victory is one that meets us right in the middle of all our fears and joys. It tells us again of God's great plans for us. That these temporary bodies are one day going to wake up eternal like his. That this mortality is going to be clothed in immortality because death is now swallowed up. Death has lost its sting and God has given us this victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's exciting and terrifying. It's the best news possible, but it's also news that changes the way we see everything. The way we see our lives. The way we see the things in this life we chase after, the ways we see the people around us, because we're no longer a people who are living just for this life. We have eternity in mind now. And when the world looks like it's falling apart more and more each day, in that fear we find joy in knowing that Christ promises so much more than we can even see. And just as he has risen and is resurrected, he's coming back to restore all things. When the world seems like it could give us everything that we would ever want, we remember that Christ has so much more in store for us, more than we can even see. And so we don't get too attached. We fear and trust and love him above all things. Maybe the best news of all is while we're figuring out this frightening and exciting journey, trying to faithfully follow and share all that God has done, Christ comes to meet with us along the way. Did you hear that at the end of our text? As the women set off to go find Jesus in Galilee, it was Jesus who came and found them and met them on the way. And they took hold of his feet And they worshipped him. And so it is with us. As we make our way through this life, living in this new resurrection reality, looking for God and trying to grasp all that this means, it's Jesus who meets us and welcomes us. And we worship him. We meet with him in places like this where he keeps on giving us his word. He gives us grace and forgiveness, all that's needed. Until we too get a step into that resurrected life when the chill of death is gone forever and the thrill of life forever with God and with each other is all that's left before us. And that seems kind of exciting and terrifying to think about. But the good news is that Jesus is right in the middle of it all. So you don't have to be afraid. Go and tell all who will hear 
that Christ is seen and Christ is with us. That Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. And in Jesus' name, amen. Now gather together as God's people, we stand for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again today that you've given us your Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior. We come to you in resurrection, joy, and hope, knowing that by the power of Jesus' cross and empty tomb, we are made whole and forgiven, made to be your daughters and sons, that all who have come and gone before us, those that we have lost and loved, now belong to this promise of life as well. And for that, we thank and praise you. We pray especially today, Father, for the mother of Professor Tom Seleska as she begins treatment today for lung cancer. Gracious Father, we pray that you would be with and watch over Sally as she prepares for this treatment. Give her peace and comfort by your presence. Equip the doctors and medical teams to care well for her, that there would be minimal effects from this treatment, and that she would be restored through this and be able to return to her life and loved ones. Give peace and patience to the Seleska family as well as they care for Sally in her time of need. Merciful God, we pray for the students, staff, and faculty from Cardinal Stritch University in the wake of the announcement of the closing of this school. We ask that you would comfort all those who mourn the loss of a place that has equipped and blessed so many students and given purpose and vocation to many staff and faculty. Guide all who belong to this community in the days ahead as they celebrate the work of this institution and as they look to you for the path that you will lay before them, knowing that you do hold all our plans and you work them out for our good. These prayers we lift to you along with all that are on our hearts and minds, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now we go with God's blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.